Chapter 8 He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his Maker, but he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. Proverbs 14.31 Solomon lay in his brushy recline at the bottom of the ravine. As the moon began to rise, he held his stomach and shivered against the memory pangs, then finally dozed off into a fitful half-sleep. The misty autumn dew came in like a cruel handmaid and dropped a cold, wet blanket over his outer clothing. Now surely, Yachin and Boaz will find me soon. But Solomon's guards were not as near as he supposed. Upon returning to camp and finding him missing, they had first scoured the nearby area to no avail. In growing panic, they returned to camp and tried to discern the trail by which their king had left. However, they seized upon the wrong trail, one which led to the far side of the mountain, where they were even now combing the wilderness in a desperate search. Meanwhile, Solomon roused, awakened by the unexpected sound of music. Angels. The singing of angels. Or, or, just where was he, anyway? He looked up at the starry sky and remembered. The Orion had moved west out of his immediate vision. The harvest moon was about a quarter of the way up the sky. That meant perhaps an hour had passed. But what was that sound? Footsteps. Singing. Why, it was a woman passing not ten cubits from him. Apparently, he had fallen near a path that circled around the base of the ridge. He strained and looked around behind himself to see a dark form moving down the trail away from him, the music of her humming fading off into the night. He could see she was carrying a large basket balanced on her head. He squinted through the brush and noticed the silhouettes of some carefully placed post and vines. A vineyard. The woman continued down the path. He thought, probably a laborer or a slave coming in late from a day of harvesting. Suddenly, there was a shout, the sound of a commotion, and the voice of an angry man down the path. Such trash as this? Look what your bleeding heart ways have brought upon us. The woman's response was soft and indiscernible. Then a child's voice broke in. Please, I did not know I was in your vineyard. I thought I was in hers. I warned you about this, shouted the man. You let one of them in. Next thing you know, the whole country is overrun with them. Look at this. They're probably a becca and a half worth of grapes you have there, you scurvy little thief. Ouch! Let go of me, screamed the child. Now that's enough, Barkos, shouted the woman. Let her go. No! Who's going to pay for this? I'm going to tie you up and throw you in the swamp, you worthless little waif. This is private property, and we will not tolerate the child begin to cry. Look, exclaimed the woman, I have more than enough here to replace what she has taken. For all the grapes she has in that little basket, you can take double from what I have here. Don't you realize that the only reason the ground produces fruit for us at all is because we honor the one who created it? The law of Moses allows the orphan and widow to glean. Disregard the laws of God and you will see this whole valley turned into a desert. Listen, I'm not King Solomon here, woman. I have just one little patch of ground, that's all I got, and it's barely enough to live on. You quote the law to me? I'll give you some law. That's my landmark right there. This is my land, that was my father's land, and anyone who wants any fruit can get it at the market tomorrow morning as long as they show money to pay for it, he yelled. The woman responded softly. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate. The Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. And that is not the law. Those are the words of King Solomon. Solomon's eyebrows went up in curiosity at her mention of his name. 
He leaned around, trying to get a better view through the brush, surprised to hear himself correctly quoted in such a remote place. When King Solomon sees what I have to deal with, then maybe he'll have something to say to me, the man seethed. Till then, it's far too easy for him to sit up there in his marble palace and spout proverbs. Now give me my fruit back. My lord, would it be all right with you if you took my fruit too? asked the woman. Here, take it, it's yours. And all the profit from it, and anyone else you find gleaning here by mistake, you just come to me, and I'll replace double for what you have lost. I will not have orphan children going hungry in this land of abundance with which God has blessed us. All right, you got yourself a deal, woman. There were a few moments of silence as the man stomped off. Then the woman called out loudly. And the only reason Solomon has anything at all is because he's a man who honors the God of Israel. Her words echoed off the hills and hung in the quiet night air, drawing no response. Then she began to speak softly, comforting the whimpering child. Solomon leaned forward, straining to hear, to get a better look. After a few moments, the woman and child disappeared back down the path. Solomon rolled back onto his back and stared up into the sky again. The majestic form of an eagle passed into his view in a long, slow circle. Then he saw it joined by a second, tracing the same circle of flight. For a long time, the final words of the woman rang in his ears. Finally, he fell asleep again and soon found himself in the grip of a strange and unsettling dream. He was traveling somewhere on urgent business, feeling the weight of responsibility and desperate to get to his destination. He was walking alone down a mountain road with no map to guide him. All at once, he came to a place where many roads crossed. There were no signs or markings of any kind to tell him which to take. Desperate to continue toward his destination, he knelt before the Lord and asked him which road to follow. Not receiving any discernible answer, he set out in what appeared to be the general direction he needed to go. After a short while, the road dead-ended at a little provincial farm. Not even a farm, really. Just a little peasant dwelling with a mud hut for a house. A couple of animal buildings, some fruit trees, and what looked like a small guest hut. He did not recognize the place. Frustrated, he hurried back to the crossroads and took another path, only to find himself arriving at the same place again, but coming at it from a different angle. The road that had existed the last time he was here was gone. He had to return by the way he had come. And so it repeated on and on. No matter which road he took, he ended up at the same place. In growing desperation, he knelt in the middle of the crossroads again, pleading with the Lord to help him find his way. When he opened his eyes, he felt something in his hand. Looking down, he saw a scrap of paper on which he read the words, Return now to the place of beginnings to the east. Solomon frowned at the strange words, then he caught something out of the corner of his eye and turned to see a sign, partially obscured in the bushes by the roadside. It had been there all along, but he had not noticed it before. He rushed forward and cleared the branches away. On the sign were printed these simple words. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Eventually, the dream faded into mist as the approaching morning coaxed him to consciousness. The emotions of the dream lingered in his soul leaving a strange and ominous imprint. Solomon opened his eyes. The morning birds were in full chorus, and the nearby plants sparkled with dew. The sun was up, but not yet visible over the ridge to the east. His whole body was stiff and cold. He rolled up into a sitting position and scanned the terrain around him. 
what had been mysterious shadows in the dark of night revealed themselves as common, simple things in the daylight. A rock, a tree, the profile of a hill. He was near the uppermost section of a vineyard that stretched up the hill, beyond which it was too steep to plant. From where he sat, across the path he could see the dark ripe fruit on the vines. His mouth watered. He leaned forward and started to stand, but gasped as sharp pain in his ankle forced him immediately to find support against a large rock. He also noticed a flurry of various aches and pains from his bruises, or was it from his awkward sleep? Judging by the tightness of his boot leather against his foot, he realized his foot must be quite swollen. He looked up and around, trying to see over the vineyard. There were probably homes nearby, but he could not see any. There was nothing to do but try to walk. Gingerly, he limped across the path and leaned on a post that supported a frame on which the vines grew. To brace himself further, he placed his hands on the two large earthen water pots that stood on either side of the post. Each movement revealed a new ache, and he realized he could hardly put any weight at all on his foot. Solomon reached up and picked a cluster of grapes. They looked delicious. From where he stood, he harvested as many as he could reach, tucking them into a fold of his clothing. Then he slumped down against the post and was about to partake when he remembered his Nazarite vow. No fruit of the vine was allowed, whether fresh, dried, or in the form of wine. Solomon groaned, looking at the delicious, ripe clusters, his mouth watering for them. And this is all over. Ought to buy a vineyard out here. The sun was rising behind the rock and promising to burst out upon him soon. That will be nice, he thought, shivering. He limped back across the trail, then realized the rock he had been leaning on was actually the stone rim of a well. As he sat down on its edge, something caught his eye. He peered up the path to see a woman walking his way, carrying a large basket. She topped a rise and disappeared into a draw. A few moments later, he can hear her footsteps coming up the next rise toward him. She was humming, and Solomon recognized the tune he had heard the night before. Then she appeared over the rise, fully covered from head to toe in the manner of a virgin, in a plain laborer's tunic of drab gray, undyed wool. Merrily, she came marching up the path. Shalom, he said. Startled, the woman turned toward him. Shalom. He looked at her. She looked at him. Her eyes peered out of her veil, the only part of her visible to interact with. A peasant girl dressed for a day of work in the field. He stared back from under his turban. He saw her eyes travel down, scanning his appearance and clothing. He glanced down. He had been dressed for the mountains. There was nothing about his attire that would reveal royalty. You know, if you want to glean here, you may want to come up the path a bit. This is Barco's vineyard, and he allows no gleaning here, she said. So I've heard. I fell from that ridge over there and spent the night in that bush. She regarded him warily. So, you heard what happened last night? Yes, I did. And still you glean here? I'm, I'm not gleaning. I have money to pay for what I have taken. She looked him over again, scanning his clothing. It was torn and dirty, damp with dew, with his unshaven face and the long stringy locks of his Nazarite vow creeping down his neck. He probably looked to her like a homeless, penniless vagabond. Well, that being the case, my lord, she said, I would just as soon have you pay me, then. Please, my lord, come down the path to glean. You can pay me next time you travel this way. You are very kind, daughter, but I have no wish to buy fruit, but neither am I gleaning. I am traveling. Does not the law of Moses allow the passing traveler to pick from the fields what his hands can hold, as long as he does not collect it into any bowl or basket? The woman pursed her lips skeptically. 
That was the only law of Moses that drifters such as this could quote. Besides which, I do not know if I can walk, he continued. I hurt my ankle when I fell off that ridge last night. Her countenance grew serious. You are injured, my lord? Yes, but not too badly, I think. Her eyes traveled down. May I examine your ankle? He studied her thoughtfully. He did need help. If you would be so kind, you are aware if your neighbor's ox stumbles, you shall certainly not walk by. How much more a man, for it is not oxen that God is concerned about, but men. She glanced into his eyes, then set down her basket. This particular vagabond knew the law a bit better than most, and she was beginning to notice a certain polish in his speech and manners. He leaned back over the well and stretched out his legs. Then he pulled up his robe to reveal his feet, immaculately clad in long black leather boots. She stepped forward and peered at them curiously. He noticed her skeptical expression. And the hand of a thief is to be cut off, he offered, tossing out a common misquote. That is not the law of Moses. Neither am I a thief, she sighed. Well then, whoever you are, let's have a look at that ankle. She knelt down and gently felt his ankle with her hands. He looked down at her veiled head. There was something strangely familiar about her, but he could not quite place it. Anyway, she mumbled, glancing up at him, these boots are more of a problem now. He chuckled. He also got a good look at her eyes for the first time. They were quite striking for a peasant girl, large and dark. Don't worry, I have others. And you do know my name, he said. I beg your pardon? You already said it once. Hmm? Did you not walk up here and bid me shalom a moment ago? He asked. Shalom is your name. The sense of it. What is your name? She continued, carefully feeling around his puffy ankle. Well, I've got bad news for you, my lord. You're not going to get this boot off without a knife. Your ankle is so swollen, you won't possibly be able to pull it out. She eyed him, expecting to see some remorse at the destruction of the boot. A knife I have, Solomon said, reaching into his belt and producing an instrument with a beautiful blade marble handle, gold stop, and diamond-studded end cap. Spinning it expertly in his hand, he held the handle toward her. Her eyes went wide. And don't worry. As I said, I have other boots, too. She gingerly took the knife out of his hand. Who are you? she asked, genuinely puzzled now. I told you my name. But you did not tell me yours. My lord, I am a virgin. If you wish to speak to me by name, you must address my father first. Who is your father? My father is dead. Well, that will keep you safely anonymous for life, he quipped. She was silent for a moment, carefully working the knife down the stitches of his boot. Was she actually trying to save the boot? Then he heard her sniff. I'm, I'm sorry, he said. I didn't know you. No, it's all right, she said, calmly wiping a tear from her cheek. It was a long time ago. I'm the only one of my mother. So that's how a peasant girl comes to be the owner of such a fine vineyard. Well, technically it belongs to my brothers, half-brothers. My father also had an Egyptian wife. And your mother was an Israelite? Yes. My father wanted an Israelite son to be his heir. Instead, they got me. My brothers never forgot and, to this day, deny that I'm the daughter of their father. For if I should marry, they are afraid that this vineyard and everything else my father owned will be taken from them. I work this vineyard since it is the only support my brothers have allotted for my mother. Everything else they have kept for themselves. And will not maintain it. If I did not maintain it, 
it would become a jungle in one season. But their own mother lives like a queen. She stopped short, suddenly embarrassed that she had said so much to a total stranger. Solomon chuckled. <laughs> you do not know how a queen lives. And you do? He glanced at her. Would your half-brothers lose the inheritance if you were to marry? He asked, probing her knowledge of the law on a rather arcane point. That depends whom you ask, she said. I'm asking you. She sighed. I am no rabbi, my lord, she answered. But he saw in her eyes that she did know the answer. Well then, you won't lose any respect if you get it wrong then, will you? She stopped and looked up at him. Then she declared firmly, If I marry and the man is an Israelite, he has an inheritance of his own, so there is no risk to them. If I marry a non-Israelite, he has no inheritance here. So again, there is no risk. Well said. Yet they still worry. Yes. Why? Because the law, to them, is like a metal rod. It has been twisted so far, so often, that they do not know any more which way is straight. Hmm, Solomon responded, eyebrows going up. May I have permission to quote you? She looked up at him in surprise. I have occasion to comment on the law from time to time, he explained. She sighed. <sighs> if the uncensored ramblings of an ignorant peasant girl could ever be of such noble use, I would be the last person to object. But I confess I find the likelihood of such a thing laughably remote. Solomon looked at her anew. Her answer sounded as little like the ramblings of an ignorant peasant girl in eloquence as it did in unaffected humility. A wise statement recommends itself, dear maiden, he replied carefully, and the station of its source cannot detract from it. She blushed. In any case, I merely intended to note that you do seem to know something of the law, he added. Yes, well, perhaps I'm just too innocent to know any better than just to take it for what it says. You see, Baal Haman owns most of the land around here, even though he is no Israelite. He did not obtain it by following the law, but by making the law follow him. My brothers have seen this happen so many times, they have no confidence in the law. My brothers are not Israelites either, at least according to Baal Haman, so they play by his rules. Which are? Which are, see things his way, and he will let you keep what you have. Stir the kettle, and you may lose everything. And you marrying would stir the kettle? She continued staring at the boot as she worked the knife farther down the stitches. You have a lot of questions, don't you? It is simply a matter of how it would appear. Yes, me marrying would raise uncomfortable questions. That, or if my other brother were to return. So your father did have an Israelite son for an heir then? She sighed. This man seemed to cut to the heart of things quickly. Frankly, my lord, I do not know if he was Israelite or not. He left before I was born, and I have never met him. I will find out if and when he returns. Solomon considered for a moment. It was a most interesting situation and this simple conversation with the peasant girl was offering him a unique perspective on life in rural Israel. He usually heard such cases while sitting in the judgment seat where every argument raised was heavily stacked. This kind of casual conversation was rare for him. He decided to keep the moment alive just for the sake of finding out what else of value he might learn from it. You have never seen your brother? Never in your life, he asked. No, never. And when he comes, I have some questions for him. Solomon's mind whirled and lit on a daring idea. Well then, ask, he blurted, not quite sure why he had just said that. 
She froze, looking up at him hard, as though trying to look right through him. Ah, he said. And how will you know it is he? She continued to stare at him. Solomon smiled at her. She studied his face, trying to see what it might reveal. He was well seasoned from his years on the judgment seat to reveal nothing with his face. He waited, but so did she. She was not going to speak next. Well then, he said, am I to gather that you have lived your whole life in expectation of the return of a long-lost brother, but you never stopped to consider how you would know him when you saw him? But my mother, she began, realizing right away that after so many years, her mother would not recognize him either. Well, she said finally, I guess I just supposed he would introduce himself. Hmm, Solomon responded. And just how would he know you? She was silent. There is many a man who could be your brother if he were to find out there was a fine vineyard in it for him, Solomon warned. She remained quiet. He waited. Finally, she looked up firmly. I do not like this game, my lord. It seems to me that you ask me what you alone can answer. My true brother, seeking me out with honest intentions, would have the advantage of forethought. With an estate hanging in the balance, he certainly would have foreseen this moment and would come with proof. The onus is on you, my lord. If you are truly my brother, you tell me, how do I know it? Solomon hesitated in a rare moment of indecision. It was the perfect answer. She held his gaze in silence and returned to working on the boot. Solomon's mind sped ahead, trying to locate an answer quickly. If, in fact, he were her brother and knew where to come to find her, he would also know other things, things about her, perhaps some family secrets, things that could prove his identity to her. This little peasant girl had all but broken his ruse in a moment. He inhaled to speak, but then yelped in pain as the boot suddenly slipped off his foot with a lurch. The woman looked up to see him grimacing, his pupils dilating with the pain, eyes tearing up. Yet, he cried out only the once. She winced as well to see him suffering, though he now displayed immense control not a common trait in a beggar. My lord, I'm afraid your ankle is broken, she said. Solomon nodded vigorously in agreement. Then a thin line of blood appeared on his ankle where the seam of the boot had been. Soon it flowed freely down his leg and off his foot. Oh, my soul, the woman cried. Look what I have done. I'm so sorry I've cut you. Oh, I'm so clumsy. She began to cry, looking all around for a cloth or something, anything, to use on the wound. Forgive my immodesty, please, she said finally as she removed the part of her veil that went over her head and bent down to wrap his foot in it. As she did, a splendid head of flowing hair, black and shiny as a raven, was released like a waterfall. Her tears dropped down onto his feet, mixing with the blood as her hands worked quickly to get the scarf around behind the heel. Her long, wavy locks hung down onto the front of his foot, getting mixed in with the blood and tears. She bundled a shiny lock of hair into one hand and used it to wipe up the bloody mixture, quickly bringing the scarf around to the front of his foot. Then she wrapped the scarf, gently but tightly, several times around, and up the ankle. Solomon was absolutely stunned as he watched her perform with such sacrificial kindness for a complete stranger. Here he was, for all she knew, a homeless, destitute beggar, or worse, some kind of swindler. Yet she was treating him like the king of the world. The tears welled up in Solomon's eyes, but not on account of the pain. I am so sorry, my lord, she said with deep sincerity, looking up at him honestly 
unflinching. He looked down at her face, with its large brown eyes moistened with tears and its expression pure as a lily. He gazed upon her long, flowing hair and her neck like that of a fawn. Solomon was stunned, speechless. For a moment, he forgot the pain in his foot. He had never seen a woman so lovely, and he realized at that moment why she was so familiar. He knew this girl. When King David was old and could no longer keep warm when sleeping, a search was made through the land for a lovely maiden to assist him, keep him warm, and tend to his needs. Abishag the Shunammite was chosen. Solomon suddenly remembered his party had camped right above the village of Shunem the night before. This, therefore, was certainly that very maiden. Abishag had been deemed the loveliest virgin in all the kingdom. But it remained a rumor only, simply because she had never revealed her face. She always wore the virgin's veil, both for modesty and to prove that she was not a concubine to David. Abishag had gained a reputation about the palace for being untouchable. Solomon was one of the select few who had ever seen her without her face covering. That was at least five years ago, and never this directly. She would allow no man to get close to her. Only those who selected her as his father's nurse knew how lovely she truly was. Solomon was certain, without a doubt, that this was Abishag. But would she recognize him? He calculated quickly. She had certainly seen him before, but that would have been when he was barely more than a boy and beardless. He would have gained at least four inches in height since then, and a fair amount of weight. He and Abishag had seldom been in close proximity, and even then, all the attention would have been on his father. He was certain. She had never seen him out of his royal attire, and certainly never with long hair. Slowly, he pulled back the turban that had been partially covering his face against the night mist. She continued to look at him, frowning just a touch, but saying nothing. Daughter, he said softly, your apology is accepted, and your kindness is beyond measure. But it is really I who ought to be apologizing to you. I wanted to make sure it was you with whom I was speaking. And that is why I questioned you so. I meant no harm. My lord? she asked. Suddenly, Solomon said something surprising even to himself. I have been to Jerusalem in search of you. I had expected to find you there, but you were not found. This was the only other place I knew to come. Certain things were told me as a lad. Your name, where my family was, where I might find you. And when you worked in the king's employ, the word reached my ears, and I went there in search of you. What was he doing? It was as though he were hearing someone else speak. Her eyes narrowed. How do you know that? No one here knows that it was I, and only those in the king's house would have my name. Have you been to the king's house? I have. When I came to Jerusalem in search of you, they confirmed to me that you were alive. If I could speak your name to you, would you find it convincing? Say it, she breathed, her eyes wide with wonder. Abishag. Yes she whispered. For a maiden who had worn the virgin's veil since the first blush of womanhood, it was unprecedented for her to meet a stranger who could look at her face and declare to her her name. But still, his story did not make complete sense. It did not explain why he, if he were indeed her brother, would have known to look for her at the king's house. Her name had not been published. She frowned. I do not understand. He also knew his story did not entirely add up, but he had certainly gained her attention. 
What to do now? He had waded in quite far, more so, in fact, than he had originally intended to, and he was not quite sure why. But he also felt compelled to continue just a bit farther. Then he would reveal his identity. He looked down at her. Daughter, I'm sorry if I've confused you, but certainly you would agree that, at the very least, we have some things to talk about. But at the moment, I am quite weary from an uncomfortable night. And if you please, I need to get somewhere where I can obtain care. Could you please go for help? A donkey would suffice. My lord, I have no donkey. But my home, and that of my mother, is not far from here. Whether you are my brother or not, I would be honored to serve you there, if you can but walk a short space, and then... After you have rested, we will talk. Solomon smiled. She smiled back. With your assistance, I can travel. Here, help me up, he said, reaching up with his hands. Yes, yes, of course, she said. She took him by the arm. Carefully, he pulled himself up on his good leg, putting his arm around her shoulder. Together, they turned and faced the path. Then, slowly, they began working their way down the hill in the direction from which she had come. It was difficult going at first, and they had to keep the motion of their feet synchronized to make any good progress. Solomon winced in pain several times when their steps became disorganized, and he briefly put weight onto his broken foot. But after a while, they found the necessary harmony. There was not a lot of room for conversation in this awkward trip, but Solomon, in spite of his discomfort, could not help but noticed the ravishing beauty of the woman by his side. She was truly stunning. He was certain no man had ever walked so closely with her for such a distance, and only under circumstances such as these would it ever be possible. The richest, most powerful man in the world found himself feeling lucky to be here. No amount of money could have bought these affections from Abishag. They were not for sale. Eventually, Solomon requested a moment to rest, and as they stood in the path, she supporting him, a man came upon them from behind. Shalom, Barkos, Abishag called out. Did you do well at the market this morning? Well enough, he said curtly, looking curiously back and forth between the odd stranger and Abishag, with part of her veil missing. What is going on here? Oh, yes, yes, of course, she said remembering the need for introductions. Barkos, this is, this is, um... I am her brother, Solomon broke in. She looked up at him, searchingly. Brother? Barkos asked. Since when did you get another brother? Or should I say, a brother? He jabbed, devilishly. I am not from around here, Solomon answered. He's not from around here she echoed, knowing at least that much was true. I left my father's house at a young age, and now I am back to claim my inheritance, he continued. Abishag didn't know quite how to behave. She did not want to deny his story, but neither could she affirm it, so she just stood by, looking nervously. The man snorted. Well, brother, he said mockingly, I know a few other brothers who might have something to say about that. That will be addressed at the proper time, but if you don't mind, my lord, we need to get home. Hey, hey, don't stop on my account, he said gruffly. I got things to do here, too. He tromped on down the trail. Meanwhile, Abishag's mother, Abella, was in the farmyard, going about her morning chores, when she looked up, and did a double take at the strange sight on the path leading to her humble home. Two figures, strangely linked, one looking very much like her daughter, though partly unveiled, inched their way closer. Abella quickly led the kid goats she was feeding back to their pen and scurried over to her mud hut. It appeared she was going to have a visitor, and she did not want to be an unprepared hostess. She put some bread that had been baked the day before, along with some goat cheese and grapes, onto the wood crate she used for a table. Through the open door, she could see the pair slowly making progress 
up the gentle rise into the yard. She could see now that the man was injured, and she hurried out to meet them. When Solomon looked up from studying the ground, he immediately recognized the place as the one in his dream. A shalom, my lord, Abella said, bowing deeply before Solomon. I see that you are in need of assistance. Please come inside. Solomon was sweating hard from the pain and exertion of the walk. He could not respond, but looked eagerly toward the open door with relief upon his face. At long last, they entered, and Solomon was carefully made to recline on a straw tick bed, a sackcloth pillow placed behind his head, and his injured foot lifted to rest at last on a pile of blankets. He sighed deeply, and, with eyes closed, spoke into the room. I thank you ever so kindly, dear woman, for your hospitality and for the noble daughter that you have raised. You rest now, my son, the widow said. You've got some healing to do. Something touched his hand. He opened his eyes and saw that Abishag was holding a cup of milk. He nodded and took the gift, drinking it down without stopping for a breath. Then he leaned back on the pillow and closed his eyes again. Abishag watched as his fingers slowly relaxed on the cup. Just after he released it, but in the moment before it dropped, she deftly took it from his hand. Immediately, his breathing grew deep and steady. Abishag crossed the room and stood before her mother, who looked up curiously. Mother, she whispered, do you know who this is? Who, who it is? Why, no. Do you? Look at him. I mean, really, look at him. Abella looked her guest over, up, down, face and clothing. Abishag watched her mother closely, her own face pensive with excitement. Abishag, Abella said finally, what do you see? Abishag proceeded to tell her about everything that had happened, watching her mother's eyes grow wide when she told the part about him claiming to be her brother. From time to time, Abella glanced over at the strange man in the corner. Tell me, mother, the truth. Tell me about your other son. Tell me about my brother. What happened back then? How would we know him now if he were to come to us? So that was it. The widow stared at her daughter in curious silence, then took a deep breath and walked over to the open doorway, staring out as if searching for something a great distance off. Abishag, I have never spoken with you about this out of respect for your father and for your brothers who are living. But now it appears the time has come. Your brother is not an Israelite. Before I was married to your father, I had another husband who died, a Phoenician. Mother? Abishag broke in. Yes, yes, you see, in those days we did not live here in Shunem. My family grew up in the land, the tribe of Naphtali, to the north which borders what is now the land of Tyre. We were not a rich family, but my father worked the land. We survived, but with not much to spare. Then a famine came upon us, and my father fell into debt to a rich man, a craftsman from across the border, in Tyre. In order to recover his money, he was going to take our family's land. In those days, you understand, the land was sacred, and the landmarks were still respected. My father would have sooner given the man his own two hands than to give up the inheritance of the Lord to a foreigner. So the man gave him another option, the hand of his daughter in marriage, as full payment. Oh, he sold you out, Abishab gasped. No, daughter, he did not. Nor did he force me. I volunteered to go. The land of my family was all that we had. If I did not go, the loss would not just be mine but my brothers would lose their inheritance forever. I had to go. The man was old, older than my father. I promised my father that when he died, I would come back to Israel 
and find a husband from among my own people, if possible, be buried here in the land of promise. She stopped speaking, staring out into space, lost in memories. What happened then? Hmm. Oh, yes, well, in the course of time I became pregnant and gave him a son in his old age. He knew of the promise that I had made to my father to return home, so he required that I make a promise to him that his son would be raised in his own land. The boy was still very young when his father died, but his father was wealthy, had left an estate for him, and had paid for his career. He was to be trained as a craftsman like his father, even from his tender youth, had contacts who informed me of his progress for a time. He proved himself talented and became successful in the trade, as expected. I have not heard of him for many years now. But if he carried any measure of his father's talents, he very likely became a great man in his field. That would explain his wealth, Abishak whispered to herself, remembering the fine boots and the expensive blade. Oh, certainly, the widow said. There's every reason to expect his wealth would be great. Mother, Abishag said, leaning forward seriously. What is his name? <laughs> his name? The woman chuckled. The name is not how you will know him, for his name is common. You must ask his father's name. And what is that? Fakir Bashar Khalid, she declared, saying it reverently, as if it were an incantation. Fakir Bashar Khalid, Abishag repeated, searching for a way to remember the regal-sounding name. The two women looked back at their guest, still motionless in the corner, and silently considered the unique moment. Well, then that explains, Abishag said, her mind putting things together. If he is the son of a prince, that explains his access to the king's court why he would have had contacts there where he could have heard about me and asked about me. The older woman nodded. Yes, I suppose it does, but what it does not explain is, how did he know your name, having been born before you? Hmm, Abishag replied, not finding an easy answer to this. Neither did Solomon, who, it turned out, had been listening intently to every word. The Tyrian's name sounded faintly familiar to him. Where had he heard it before? His mind began tracing the royal genealogies he had memorized for the kingdom north of Israel. Where was that name found? It would come to him, he knew. The situation was most interesting. With this new information, he believed he could continue with the role, if he so chose, where he could demonstrate all the necessary knowledge. But it raised another problem. It meant that his character was not an Israelite, at least not fully so, and had no right to claim an inheritance, and more than that, no need for one. Abishag, Abella continued, now that I have told you all of this, it is time to tell you something else. When my Tyrian husband died, I returned to Israel to marry again. I did not know until months later that the Lord had placed a second child in my womb. You lost him? Abella smiled. No, I still have her. Abishag's mouth dropped open. I did not tell you because you were already so disrespected by your brothers. Since they were only half Israelite, I wanted you to have the advantage of being considered a full Israelite. But no, you are of that Tyrian father. Solomon listened, but at the same time his mind probed the other question, the one he could not quite answer, not even to himself. The question of why. Why was he doing this? As mother and daughter continued to talk things over, his mind wandered. He thought about Hava and the great tragedy that had become of her. He thought of the kings of Egypt and Ammon and the wives they had sent him, 
He thought about the daughters of Jerusalem and how they continually fawned over him so. He thought of his need for a queen and an heir to the kingdom and the stark vacancy left by Hava's fall. For as long as he could remember, his future queen had been known to him. It was a given in life, just like the fact that he would one day be king. Now he was suddenly in desperate need of a queen. Solomon had found himself totally unprepared for such a surprising turn of events. How does one go about finding a queen when she who has been chosen for you is disqualified? Well, I suppose you must feel the position wisely, just like any other position in your kingdom. What kind of woman makes a good queen? Then he considered Abishag, her beauty, her nobility, and her chastity. She was a unique person, at the very least. He also became aware that for a short time he had spent with her, the blanket of sorrow which threatened to consume him had lifted. Even the soft rhythm of her voice across the room right now was soothing to his ears. She had treated him like a king, even though she did not know he was one. Could this peasant girl be queen material? He turned the thought over in his mind. But then, the revelation about her birth. She was not fully Israelite. How could it be possible that the Lord desired him to take a Gentile bride as queen? It was a most surprising thought, but under the circumstances, he could not dismiss it. It was clear the Lord had led him here for some reason. Aside from the question of her ethnicity, how could he determine Abishag's fitness for the role? It would require careful consideration. It would require talking with her, not just knowing about her, but knowing her heart as well. That would take time and careful observation. Given the chance to examine her, he knew he would be able to determine if she was really as special as she seemed. And what then if she was? What if she was? Solomon knew if he, as king, asked her to marry him, she would certainly not deny him. No maiden in the kingdom would. But would she marry him if he were not king? This kind of information would be extremely hard to obtain, considering his position. But he realized that, at this moment, he had a unique opportunity to learn this very thing. He had never had an opportunity like this before, and it was unlikely he ever would again. How does the king hide? Yet, here he was, hidden, and given the rare chance to secure a bride in whom he would never have any doubt. But there was also a risk. What if she chose against him? What then? Could she be compelled to marry him anyway? No, certainly not as queen, at any rate. He sifted the possibilities in his mind. He did not want to go back to Jerusalem. That was the last thing he wanted. He had been on a journey to Tyre, but... There really was no pressing need for him there either. What he needed, what he really needed right now was, well, it was this, a place like this. He needed an escape, a chance to live a simple life in a small, quiet place where he could be alone, away from the pressure, away from the confusion, and alone with his God. Then he remembered his dream of the previous night. The words on the sign stretched out before him like a clear picture in his mind. A man's heart prepares his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Quietly, in his own heart and mind, he offered a prayer before the Lord. God of my fathers, if you have directed me here, if you wish me to do this thing, please speak to me right now. The women had been talking softly, but just at that moment, they paused. At precisely that instant, Solomon heard an eagle scream out past the open door over the distant hills, the same eagle that had coaxed him out of his tent the night before, the same that caused him to fall down the hill, which led to his being where he was now, the same that hovered over him through the night as he dreamed. Solomon made his decision. He would stay until he had his answer.